One of the mistakes Mellaby makes is putting his trust in fortune. Now, you remember fortune from Boethius. Prudence reminds him that his willingness to be easily persuaded by the sweetness of rhetoric, Mellaby fears he's in a bind. His honor and his household has suffered a violent home invasion. But Mellaby trusts in his potential victory in war because fortune has nourished me from my childhood. Now, in that sense, Mary is not his alma mater, his nourishing mother, but fortune. But prudence warns him that at his Revenge is perilous because fortune is never to be trusted. Trusteth not in her, for she is not steadfast and estable. For when thou trowest to be most sure and sicker of her help, she will fail thee and deceive thee. And whereas ye saying that fortune has nourished you from your child held, I said it so much so shall ye the less trust in her and in her wit. For Seneca saith, Seneca, what man that is nourished by fortune, she maketh him a great fool. The monk's tale is about the failure of fortune to come through in the end. Now, overtly, the tale is based on Boccaccio's De Cassibus Virorum Illustrium, or On the Fall of Illustrious Men as is noted in the tale's rubric. Here beginneth the monk's tale, De Cassibus Virorum Illustrium. That's the title of Boccaccio's book. Boccaccio's text is filled with secure rulers whose turn on the wheel goes downhill. But only six of the 17 examples or exempla are inspired by Boccaccio. You also find for example, the killing of Peter of Cyprus. That's from Machaut's account of the siege of Alexander. There's that terrible story about the children and Count Ugolino of, of Pisa dying in prison. That comes from Dante's Inferno. So it's a pretty flexible text. I mean, all you need is fortune rising and then fortune falling. With such a diversity of texts, the monk's tale is very much a compilation or compilatio. In fact, the Canterbury Tales is, is like that as well, a sort of medieval mixtape of various tracks. There's also Chaucer's interesting game of hiding his sources. Remember that I told you about the old Chaucer rule that he never mentions his true literary influences, those are always hidden. When he talks about Zenobia, the queen who marries a prince and then holds his realm together against his enemies after he dies, which is a stirring exemplum of the virtues of women before being brought down by a Roman emperor. The monk wants to help us uh, with more details about our conquest. Notice this is not the rhyme royale, but an eight-line stanza. Herbatize, whoso list for to read, whoever wants to read them, again support the king and other more, and how all this process fill indeed, why she conquered, and what title thereto, and after of her mischief and her woe, how that she was besieged in a take, let him unto my master Petrarch go, that writ enough of this I undertake. Well, what's the problem? The clerk's master, Petrarch, did not write this. It's actually a Middle English translation by Chaucer of Boccaccio's De Mulieribus Claris on famous women. One of the sources as well of Christine de Pizan's City of Women. So we get a translation of Boccaccio, but from another text, not the one Chaucer is supposedly translating from, and then he attributes it to the clerk's master, 
Petrarch. So this is classic Chaucer, just like when we saw Boccaccio's Knight's Tale being hidden through Statius. So this leads to some questions regarding that rubric. Is it authentically Chaucer's? Like, would Chaucer overtly identify his source so openly? My master Petrarch, who does that remind you of? That's the clerk's tale. Remember the clerk describing how he heard Boccaccio's tale? I will you tell a tale which that I learned of Padua of a worthy clerk, as proved by his words and his work, he is now dead and nailed in his chest. I pray to God, so give his soul rest. Francis Petrarch, the laureate poet, kicked this clerk whose rhetoric sweet and illumined all Italy of poetry. Number 12. Is the monk's tale perhaps the clerk's second tale? I mean, it's super boring. It seems to suit the clerk better than the monk. Remember, it's a very learned tale. It's full of exempla. If we did one of those traditional character analysis, it's clearly the clerks. The monk, remember, is a manly man, an outrider who's not interested in books, the complete opposite of the clerk. Later, after the knight's interruption, the host suggests, Sir, say somewhat of hunting, are you pray? Nay, quote this monk, I have no lust to play. The bells on his horse mention the general prologue are now used as a joke. Here, without the bells, we would have totally fallen asleep listening to this story. Sir Monk, no more of this, so God you bless. Your tale annoyeth all this company, which talking is not worth a butterfly. For therein is there no disport, no fun in no game. Wherefore, Sir Monk, Don Pierce, by your name, I pray you heartily tell us something else, for surely ne'er clinking of your bells, that on your bridle hang on every side, by heaven's king that for us all died. I should ere this had fallen down for sleep. Does this sound like the kind of tale the monk would have told? And the knight's reaction is instructive. Whoa, quoth the knight, a good sir, no more of this. That he had said is right enough, he wis. And much more for little heaviness is right enough to much folk, I guess. That the tale ends with an explicit, explicit tragedia, thus ends this tragedy, or, um, implies, even though we are clearly seeing an interruption by the night, that the tale is over as well. Were you as struck? by this word tragedy as I was in the prologue? Or else first tragedies will I tell, of which I have an hundred in my cell. Tragedy is to say, a certain story is old books mocking us memoria, of him that stood in great prosperite, and is it fallen out of high degree into misery, and endeth wretchedly. Tragedy is not a common word in this period to describe a genre. What is a tragedy as we understand it? Our definition comes from Aristotle's poetics, or more specifically, a Renaissance reading of Aristotle's poetics, that the tragic hero or character has a tragic flaw. This feature of character leads to a disaster. Now, Aristotle, in his book, instead points to events and to conflicts and to speech acts. But Aristotle's poetics was completely not read in the Middle Ages. It lacked relevancy. They didn't have the Greek text that he's talking about, since the poetics is filled with examples of Sophocles and Euripides and Aeschylus. They didn't have those access to those works. In terms of language and language theories, the Middle Ages is resolutely Ciceronian.
It's all about Cicero, as you saw in the Merchant's Tale. Aristotle is famous at this period only for his philosophy, as we saw in the general prologue's description of the clerk that he has Aristotle's books. Tragedy in the Middle Ages was defined as a literary genre associated with the workings of fortune. In particular, about a man of high estate falling into disgrace and misery. The monk also identifies certain formal features associated with this genre, tragedy. And they've been versified commonly of six feet, which men clep in hexametron. Hexameter, right? Six feet. Six feet. In prose eke been indict many one, and eke in meter and many a one sundry wheeze. Lo, this declaring odd enough suffies. It can be written in many kinds of meter, originally written in hexameter, but now they can also be written in prose or any other meter in many a sundry wheeze in many different ways. And in this case, he uses, he'll use the uh, Eight line stamp. John of Garland in 1260 defines tragedy in an even simpler fashion without the formal elements. Tragedy is a song or poem composed in the high style, beginning in joy and ending in grief. Now the knight's problem is that tragedy focuses on only one aspect of fortune, its downside, and that makes it very boring. Because there's an upside. I say, for me, it is great disease, whereas men had been in great wealth and ease to hear an of her sudden fall, alas. And the contrary is joy and great solace, as when a man hath been in pauvre stat, in climbeth up and waxen fortunat. I mean, the knight is so optimistic. He wants people to rise out of their poverty. And there abideth in prosperite. Switch thing is gladsome, as it thinketh me, and of switch thing were gladly for to tell. Yea, quote our host by St. Paul's Bell. This doesn't work out. This is going to be a tragedy. Why not listen to a good story with a happy ending? Why not just set aside tragedy for comedy? And that's why we get the next tale, Chanticleer. Alright guys, don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that notification bell. What's the problem? I think it has a soggy bottom. Tragic.